teaching creativity is is my particular corner. Mm. A huge part about teaching creatively that we found over the last five years of running these workshops is that a lot of what goes on is simply giving people permission to let teachers buy into this is your studio. You can do what you want. It's as if they feel there's music police looking around the corner keeping notes and they have to do it just the way they were taught. (laughs) You can teach it any way you like. And the more you teach the way you like, the more you have a sort of a brand. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Welcome back to another edition of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, and thanks so much for listening. Wherever you are in the world and whatever you're doing at the moment, I really appreciate that you're spending your time with me. My name is Tim Topham and I'm the teacher behind the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the blog at timtopham.com and the Inner Circle Piano Teaching Community. And this is the podcast to listen to if you're interested in teaching in a more contemporary and creative way. Each week, we explore fresh ideas for your teaching and business, interview the most interesting and innovative music educators from around the world and give you a regular dose of creative inspiration for your studio. Today's show notes and a full transcript are available at timtopham.com slash episode 75. So in today's session, we're going to be talking about the five myths of improvisation. And we're also going to take the opportunity to have a bit of a chat about another important subset of improvisation, accompaniment patterns, and how you can improvise accompaniments for your students, why you'd want to do that, uh, and a discussion around how all that interlinks into both improvisation and things like chord charts and lead sheets. And I've invited a very special guest to join us today. He is one hell of a cool cat at the keyboard and one of the best improvisers and teachers that I've met. He's a composer, creative pianist, multi-instrumentalist, recording artist, author, and educator specializing in improvisation. And if you've ever heard of the Toberine, well, he's the inventor of that too. He's also a country boy at heart. He loves his cows, riding horses along the beach at sunset, and drinking coffee through a straw. I'd be, I'm proudly working alongside him and another fantastically creative teacher, Lee Levis, at the 88 Creative Keys Workshops in Denver in July. We'll hear more about that in a moment, but please welcome the one and only Bradley Sowash. How are you going, Happy Bradley? Happy to be here, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Great, Great to have introduction. You. Great to have you on the show. And look, the last time you were on was episode five. You were one of those pioneering teachers who put up their hand when I said, uh, guys, I'm starting a podcast. Uh, are you up for being one of my guests? And having no idea what you're in for, you and Leela both gladly put your hand up and um, and said yes. And I think think back then we talked about um, improvisation and getting started with creativity. But I was interested to know what's been the biggest change in your teaching since you were on that episode, which is now 18 months or more ago. Well, I no longer teach any students on a regular basis one-to-one i've switched to uh, in-person group lessons i'm teaching four at a time but more importantly and i think i may be the pioneer in this i'm teaching online group pop jazz improvisation lessons so it's a group lesson online and i have about three adult amateur pianists and um, right now about 17 or so piano teachers actually Um, and we're all studying piano pop jazz styles uh, but through uh, a a platform that allows me to see them and play and and we interact and it's just it's just delightful it's my favorite part of the week it's it's great and it's been uh, I remember you talking about moving across to this new way of teaching uh for a number, a whole lot of different reasons. Um, but have you found it to be a successful way for people to learn as well as you f- to be able to scale your teaching? It's, it, yes, it's, it's you know, the interesting about the scaling the teaching, it, it, it is, a, if you want to look at just from the financial end, it makes for a, a pretty high pay rate for that one hour, except it involves a lot more planning than the usual sort of rolled in and, pl- and teach the individual. Um, the, the students really appreciate a, the – I do extensive lesson plans, extensive assignments. Uh, there's tons of handouts, and we all interact together on a Facebook private group. 
where I encourage them highly and they follow through on posting videos of their progress. So throughout the week, I'm also providing commentary and, and critiques on their, on their playing and their progress. And the neat thing is so do the peers. So there's this whole nice group energy going on. Um, it's really in many ways almost more satisfactory than it, uh, an in-person lesson uh, with cameras all over you can see the overhead of my fingers and my, and my face and I can see them and make them bigger and smaller um, as they play. The only thing I regret is that that's a huge part of my normal teaching that where I accompany the student, either with small hand percussion or on the piano. And because the Internet's lag, I can't do that. And, and that's a shame because it's so important in an in-person lesson to transfer the musicality directly without so much teacher talk. So I'm very big on accompaniment, but so far the technology is not there for that to, to happen. Okay. So before we get into it, uh, we probably better define improvisation because we're going to be using it today. And I know there's some different ways to look at it. What's improvisation to you in the context of what we're talking about today? Well, Tim, that's not a question I can answer shortly. I tend to, to think about that about half my day, most days, <laughs> So let me um, let me get at it from a couple of angles. Of course, improvisation can be so many things. It can be, I don't know if you can hear the piano, it can be free playing on, here's a, I don't know, a G chord. So I'm just playing some chords. That's one form of improvisation. Another is tiny little ornaments and embellishments that you add to a tune, not unlike what Baroque musicians were doing by putting little unwritten trills and things in, uh, little changes to the melody. It is, but in the context that I teach it in, I teach it through a jazz lens. And so I'm going to define, instead of improvisation, I'm going to define jazz. So it's a very big word to try to define. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> it's a huge bunch of styles. It almost is like saying classical, which of course encompasses a huge bunch of styles from 12th century Gregorian chant to, you know, yesterday's min minimalism. So, um, but th that's where you're going to trouble when you think about it as a style. For me, jazz is not a style of music and improvisation is not a style of music. They are approaches to making music. There's a big difference there because it's a way of music making. And here's what my definition of jazz is. I'll read it here. I've got it. Jazz is an approach to making music, not a style, that involves reading and improvising over specific rhythmic feels within a given harmonic context. Now, that's very academic, but let me break it down. <laughs> jazz involves reading and improvising. So that might already raise some eyebrows. There's this weird myth out there that, that jazz players and improvisers do everything by ear. Um, I, I don't know of any professional improvising musicians who aren't excellent readers. So it's reading and improvising over a specific rhythmic feel. And all that means is, are we talking about, um, uh, you know, a swing feel? Are we talking about, um, to, to, uh, somebody was talking about a, a tango the other day on a blues uh, podcast I heard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that was. <laughs> so these are rhythmic contexts, jazz waltz. You know, they're, they're, they're stock feelings. They're, they're things a drummer and a, and a rhythm section relates to. So those are givens. The rhythmic feel is given. And the last given is the harmonic context, which is to say the chords are already there. So most of the time, improvisers have a lot that's already a nice foundation that they're bringing a little bit of personality and personalization to. And it's not so wide open as just play whatever you want. And that makes it a lot less scary. Mm. So I define it as an approach to making music. Yeah, and, and let's face it, jazz musos, uh, wh um, while they're learning the standards and the main tunes, they'll be using some kind of lead sheets generally. Uh, eventually, they'll memorize a lot of it, I would imagine. Uh, but to get started, they have to be able to read, even if it is uh, more of a lead sheet approach than a two-handed ballad that's all written out. Right, right. Let me say one more thing about this because I'm a jazz guy. I'm going to... I'm gonna, um, definitely pop some bubbles here with this. But I, last night we saw La La Land, which is about a jazz pianist, you know, and, and it related a lot to some of his misery he felt by not being <laughs> able to play the music he loves. But I was not drawn to jazz, even though I've been a professional jazz musician for more than 30 years, I was not drawn to it by its sound or its history. That all came later. The thing that brought me to that music was it was the only place I could find a home for creativity. 
And after a while, I adapted it and learned it and studied the greats and all that. But it was it was just I was desperate as a student to try to find a way to do my own thing. And uh, rock and roll wasn't cutting it for me playing uh, block chords on an organ in bowling alleys. I did that for a while. It wasn't <laughs> interesting. So as a guy with chops and deep musical interest, it was just the freest style I could find. And, and then over time, I, I adopted it. Um, so I'm happy to improvise in any style that I that I can today. It's the improvisation, not the style that grabs me. Yeah, brilliant. All right. Well, that opened up a whole lot of can of worms I wasn't expecting, <laughs> but that's good. That's good. It just shows that it is hard to uh, to 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 cl- closely define sometimes what we mean in piano teaching. Even the word lead sheet, uh, I mean, even that people might not know what that is or have a different idea about what that is. Uh, there's a number of terminology um, things that I think we could define better as as musicians. But anyway, that's not the topic today. Well, for really, example, quick one, chord yeah. chart and lead sheets. Sometimes people use interchangeably. Two two different animals. Well, so my example. understanding, a chord chart would be what you get from Ultimate Guitar or somewhere like that, which has got lyrics and co- just chords written above it, no musical notation. And a lead sheet has got a notated melody with chords above it. Am I, is that your understanding? Correct. Yes, but to confuse the issue more, if you go to a, a big band rehearsal and they hand you the lead sheets, they say, here are your charts. So <laughs> it just course. mixes it all up. <laughs> all right. Well, look, I'm really keen to find out about your five myths of improvisation. So let's uh, let's take it through. Uh, start okay. with number one. All right. So number one, these are let me talk about these myths, just what they are. These are things that inhibit people from exploring improvisation. Myths, by definition, are are kind of things that are assumed or kind of in our bones, but but when we bring them out into the open air, sometimes they maybe don't hold up as well. So I hope to expose here a couple of um, things that are keeping people in a fixed mindset rather than a growth mindset. People people thinking, I can't do this and because I have unconsciously taken on these myths. So here's the first one. Myth number one is that you have to be born with a good ear. You either got it or you ain't. Okay, so there is, in my experience as a, a, you know, 30 plus years of improvisation, there is a bell curve of musicianship uh, talent on the ear scale. And that bell curve has a maybe a one or two percent who are extremely gifted by playing with their ear um, and relying heavily on that, which means often absolute pitch, but not just that, but uh, incredible memory to be able to, to copy the licks they hear. Um, and that is somebody like Louis Armstrong is an extremely rare skill. On the other end is the 2% uh, who are absolutely 10 years who can't count, and I do believe there are just certain very, very small percentage of people who can't seem to access their musicality. So outside of that, there's all the rest of us in this massive bell curve who can beat that myth down by – study and practice. Mm. So the myth buster is that just like traditional music skills, playing by ear, personalizing melodies and improvising, those skills are developed through study and practice. Hello, <laughs> when you're good at something, it's because you work at it. Yeah. So, so yeah. The, the issue is, of course, that uh, so many of us teachers weren't taught to practice our ears if that makes sense, uh, unless we were going up for an audition or an exam or something like that, we would be uh, run through the oral tests a couple of weeks before. Uh, but the rest of the time, we didn't often do that. And there wasn't that uh, suggestion from our teachers to, oh, go and see if you can pick this tune out by ear. So I have a feeling that's what has caused one of these myths is people that just not being aware of it and experiencing it as a child. And let me just say that improvising and playing by ear is are different skills. Uh, I consider myself a very comfortable improviser and just an average play by ear guy. Let me, I, I go often to fiddle jam sessions. I love to play fiddle and mandolin. And I sit in a room with people who play these instruments entirely by ear who cannot read a note. And it's astonishing. They're, they're saying, let's learn a new tune today. They slow it down and play it two, three times on the recording with everybody's eyes closed. And the leader says, okay, you got it. Let's play. And I've like managed to get the downbeats on most measures. (laughs) 
And then they're saying, well, you're the jazz guy. You're great at this. And not so much, actually. Picking out a tune by ear is absolutely something that, that is separate. And it's absolutely something that gets better by doing it, which is one of the reasons I'd go to these jam sessions. Mm. So, yeah. Um, you want to hear the next myth? Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do it. Okay. And myth number two is that improvisation is too difficult or it's too difficult for my students. So this myth a- arrives – from comparing ourselves to the masters. Maybe your favorite pianist is Oscar Peterson, you know, a brilliant virtuoso, regardless of style, just a technical monster. And you hear that and think, yeah, you know, I, that's so difficult or, or I, you know, I just don't have those chops. But of course, someone like Oscar Peterson is one of the greatest musicians of all time. That's no comparison. Mus- musicians improvise at all levels all the time. In fact, my myth buster is that anyone can improvise. And if you accept that myth buster, then it, there's a logical extension of that, which says by starting your students early, improvisation becomes a natural way to make music. Mm. In other words, it's just another lens in on a way to make music. Reading is half the deal. And improvising and playing by ear, those kinds of skills, are, is half the deal. Yeah. And so I it doesn't need to be difficult. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the earlier you start creating things with your students, the the better it becomes naturalized. I've got, uh, I'm, I'm planning my, um, be- my notebook beginners, uh, course and a, a webinar due to come out soon, which is all about that, that approach to just, st- just stay away from reading for a while, get the ears turned on and exploring sounds. And I'm sure you probably, I know you don't teach many child beginners these days, but you would probably feel that that's, uh, a good thing to do too, right? Right. And I, I mean, I've written beginner books. I, my creative chords series follows this exact premise where from the first page of the book, they are reading and improvising. So they learn just as one quick example, they learn this the little silly tune, hot cross buns and boom, as soon as they can play that, here's some ideas to customize it. What would you like to do differently on measure three? So that they're just alongside, there isn't even a sense that they're two different activities. So as teachers sometimes say, I don't have time to teach improvisation. Now, when would I do it? Would I do it every other lesson? Do I, how do I make time? Should it last five minutes? To me, there is not a separation. You come at the same music through both reading it and improvising with it. They're, they go back and forth very handily. Yeah. I'm very, very much in the same wavelength as you there. It, the more we pigeonhole all the activities of a piano lesson, the more we'll run out of time. You, you, ha- you have to find the interconnectedness between these things. Uh, and that's why I love uh, Paul Harris and his simultaneous learning approach from the UK. It, he's just, yeah, let's, let's everything's, an, it should be a network. Theory connects with oral, connects with improvising, connects with reading. Everything's interlinked. And if we, uh, we consider our music like that, w- we can do anything in a lesson. Right. And when it's done right, the, the student understands the reasons for things then. Yeah. Rather than running off and doing a theory notebook as a sort of unrelated side activity, which doesn't relate to anything else. It, it Absolutely. Makes it, you know. Yeah. So on to myth three. Yeah, let's do it. It's, the previous myth was about it being too difficult. I'm referring to technical difficulty. But this myth has to do with the music theory. The myth is you have to be a music theory genius to teach creativity or to play improvisation or to be a a personalizing artist personalizing meaning bring your own notes not just dynamics and phrasing but you bring your own notes to other people's music and the the reason that this myth exists is because many people especially classically trained pianists have a pretty substantial library of improvisation books because they're naturally curious about this and typically those books are just too darn hard. They start on page one and say, you know, here are eight jazz scales, including the bebop dominant and the locrian. And, 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 and they say, you know, try using these scales on the next tune. And, and immediately you're like, oh, this, what is this? It's so, so deep and heavy. And a lot of that has to do with the history of how jazz was first turned into an educational subject. A lot of it went on in North Texas State University and Indiana University uh, by a guy named David Baker and Jerry Coker and some of these legends of the beginning of jazz education. And they were teaching at the college level. So it didn't start in the, the home studio. 
And so they were coming in with students that already knew a whole lot. And that's where the, that their chapter one was based on that. Fortunately, over this past several years, there's been more authors who are realizing that there's ways to teach this a lot earlier. So my myth buster that it's too much music theory is this. If you can teach a major scale and a few chords, you have the skills you need to begin teaching improvisation. And, and let, let me just make a comment on that. I, 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 um, there are some ways into improvisation which allow the student to experience improvisation. And one of the people who's so good at that is Forrest Kinney with his um, pattern play books that where the teacher can play a pre-written part and then the student can experience improvisation by sticking to certain keys such as the black keys and so on. Um, and that's a great door opener and everybody should explore that. But what I'm talking about in improvisation and music theory, I'm talking about the next step where there's understanding of what you're playing, where the student says, this is an E flat minor chord and these are the notes in it and these are the notes that will fit with it. So that's a little bit further down the road when we've experienced it, but now we're ready to do our own music making. And I, I think those are very complementary approaches. Yeah, it's great when students start making that connection between the theory of chord progressions, chords and scales. Uh, when they start making that that move, they really take big leaps in their playing, I feel, uh, and improvising. Um, but as you say, what, to start with what works and, and the pattern play series is 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 great for that. Um, I was going to ask something else. I can't remember what it was at the moment, but it'll come back to me. Well, I can plow ahead to myth number four if you like. Let's do it. Okay, myth number four. And this is kind of hard to explain, but it here it is. Like reading music, the myth is that improvisers always know exactly what they will be playing next. In other words, if you're classically trained, you like the feeling of feeling prepared. You, you're used to, to, to knowing what's, where your pitfalls are, have ironed them out. You know what's going to happen. You've even practiced your page turns. There's a lot of givens. And, and when you encounter improvisation, then it feels like a, a uh, vacuum. There's no preparedness. You and whereas improvisers relish the lack of preparedness in the sense they relish being in the moment, not knowing what's going to come next is part of the thrill of it. So when a classical musician begins to improvise, it feels like they're on, walking on jello because they don't know what's happening and what's coming next. They don't know what they're going to play next, and that's disconcerting. They think, gee, a real improviser must know exactly what they're going to play. But that's not right. The actual myth is that even for skilled improvisers, it can still feel like stumbling around in the dark. Hmm. So when I play my concerts and I'm looking up passionately with my eyes closed in, in an apparent moment of ecstasy, <laughs> I may I just as well be praying for an idea. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I think on a, on a great night, if I'm playing to the top of my game, uh, about 75% of my notes are, are what I'd hope to play what I'm trying to hear and get out. And the other 25% are relying on knowledge and, and guesswork and, and hopes and dreams to just hopefully that it comes out musically. Hearing that come from someone who I've heard perform uh, at and been blown away by is really heartening, I think, for us uh, who are just starting our improvisation journeys to hear you say that 75% is kind of what you wanted and that's when you're on the top of your game. So I imagine there's plenty that you might be a 50-50 uh, to, to know that someone like you feels that way, I think is really, really, really good for us. Good. Another piece of that is, is thank you. Another piece of that is that sometimes, uh, uh, skilled improvisers get just run on playing. I know what notes will work. So when I'm not at the top of my game, I am just wandering around. And one of the things that I'm constantly saying to myself when I'm improvising, especially in front of listeners is Bradley, are you meaning what you play? Are you, are you saying something? Are you making a statement? Are you in clear about your intent or are you just wiggling your fingers on notes that you know will, will work? So it's kind of the same thing. It, it's, a, it's a little bit related, but it's, uh, I'm trying to just like in this podcast, I'm trying to not just stammer around and, and talk about anything that comes to mind, but try <laughs> to keep the point. It's, it's kind of like that when you're improvising. I find uh, the most improvising that I do day to day, although it's not going to happen for the time being, was when I was in my head of keyboard role over the last three years and the, my previous school, 
I would have to improvise at uh, church at services for my school uh, and just make stuff up when uh, you know time needed to be filled, and that was my chance to improvise. And that was wasn't jazz, obviously. That wouldn't be stylistically correct in that location. Uh, and and so I would I would just I would just doodle around on the keys, and I knew what would work, so I could always have a safe place to go. Uh, and, but I think the other thing I wanted to say is that sometimes when you improvise, it doesn't always work, and you're not going to necessarily be happy with what the outcome is. You, you might even have a bit of a fail, uh, but that's okay. You know, you're trying, you're pushing your boundaries. You're, as you say, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, have you had right. any times when you've played and it's been actually been a bit of a failure? Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, or just flat. Yeah. Um, but this is where the theory, where knowing your theory, and by that I don't mean the deep theory, but just knowing. Look, I'm in G major, uh, and most of these chords are in this song are in G major, so I can sit down here and use the pentatonic scale and survive. You know, that's where the, you can get through a lack of inspiration by knowing what will at least work. Yeah. It's the also, other little piece of that, and this is a big deal. I don't want to get into this too much right now, but any note can be can be fixed. Any note can be made to sound good, and you get better and better at sort of sliding from an unintended note to a more to a better note, yeah. or turning you know turning it into an ornament. And that as that skill grows, you feel more and more comfortable, like you're able to survive those um, those moments. I think it's great but, too if if a student has the skill to. Uh, work their array around the chords in a key, then it is so much better if they have memory slips and they're playing something on a concert stage. And it's happened to me many times. Uh, I'm not a not the best memorizer, but if I if my memory fails, I can keep making sounds that are in the right key while I go, oh, what have I got to do? And then I'm back into it. Okay, so I was playing the Bach three-part fugue. Is it three-part? The one that goes... And that's the oh, prelude, C and then minor. The, yeah, yeah, C minor. I was doing that in a jury in music school. And I, I, this was a sort of this will be in the movie. Um, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> they, so I, I, I had one of those memory slips, and and in the middle of a fugue, playing it without music, and it, you know, for those of you who haven't been to music school, a jury is where you have your back to four. Uh, su superior pianists who are your professors, all with notebooks with pencils. And every time you have the little slip, you hear the pencils scratching oh, away. It's oh, most... how awful. Yeah, it's awful, exactly. Oh. So I got lost. So I decided to. Um... <laughs> to sort of play in a Bachish way until I could recover. And I remembered where I was and then finished it out. So when I turned around, the head of the piano department, who's since passed on, put her glasses down on her nose and said, how dare you do that to Bach? <laughs> and then my teacher said, but I won't mention her name, but Ms., this, that is useful. Everybody has memory slips now and then to be able to recover is, uh, is, a, is a nice skill. And she said, I'm giving him lowest marks. He said, well, then I'm giving him highest marks. And the other two looked down, and um, I don't know what my final marks were, but I, I, I passed. So I, I don't know who was right. It would have been great not to have the memory slip, but it happened. So um, I would have loved to have heard it, to be honest, but that's me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right, let's go to myth number five, I think we're up to. Myth number five, only jazz musicians can improvise and only on certain instruments. Big, big myth. We think of improvisation, we right away we think of jazz because that's one of the few styles that embraces it so openly. Um, so we think maybe trumpet, saxophone, piano, bass, drums, things like that. But let's think about some of the great improvisers uh, in throughout history. Uh, so um, maybe you've heard of some of these guys. Uh, Beethoven, Brahms, Liszt, Mozart, Chopin, Bach. Chopin was such an improviser that he had a terrible time putting his music down in, in print because in concluding at least one story of running down to the publisher to change it, because he could always think of 10 more ways to play it. And this is evident in his, uh, the flourishes you see in his writing where they have 14 notes in one beat, you know, and then 12 on the next one. And you, he uh, was constantly messing with it and it was not comfortable for him to freeze it into ink because there were so many other ways to play it. But another really important improviser, and Tim, you just mentioned it, is everyone. 
let's not kid ourselves. When if you're a pianist and the fan blows the music off your stand, you know, you're noodling around. Or if you're halfway through the wedding march and the bride hasn't quite made it to the altar yet and you can't play it, you know, or you, I mean, sorry, you've played it twice and now and she's not there yet. Or the actress is off stage and having a little costume malfunction and can't get the zipper up on her dress and you're doing <laughs> – <laughs> yeah, so we all improvise all the time because things go wrong and we have to cover it. So let's not kid ourselves uh, and say we don't improvise. And I'll even go so far as to say that piano players improvise when they sight read. Give me a break. Of course you're not getting all those notes the first time through. We've figured out ways to, to call it scuffling, if you will. That's a form of improvisation. So uh, the point is, is that everybody improvises in a lot of styles and in a lot of settings and we may as well embrace it and, and make a bigger deal out of it. And uh, let me just name a few other styles that involve improvisation real quick. Bluegrass music is not set. Everybody steps forward and plays that, that solo. Let's think about something like native American flute music where you, where they improvise on a certain scale of a, of a love song, you know, to, to woo a, a, a someone that's being courted or the Indian classical music where there's a raga, which is a kind of detailed, quarter tone scale a raga for different times of the year and different religious holidays but the music's not set the sitar player works on what is only a set scale uh, so so you know african music with kalimbas and thumb pianos uh, it, you know improvising around some set notes and set rhythms so it's just everywhere and we we hide our head in the sand when we think it's just jazz uh, and and you know uh, rock guitar solos i mean it's just everywhere yeah and uh, while teachers may not think they do it very often, I think sight reading, it, it's great that you brought that up because, you know, I, my sight reading is more improvising than <laughs> just about anything. But it's the only way I've been able to get through. Part, a massive part of my job over the last six years as a teacher at a college has been accompanying other instruments and you don't have time to practice all that stuff. You've got to be a good sight reader and to be a good sight reader, you look at the chord structure, you kind of fluff your way through it and i've been the first told, thing i do is, is just as soon as i get handed that music i start writing chord symbols in as a yeah. safety net yeah i do the same and, and i've often been told wow you know that was just amazing what you did and i i, I might have been playing at half what was written and you know, it's it's great because it simplifies things uh and it makes it doable but i i really like that connection between improvisation and sight reading you you're absolutely right um, right. I, I wanted to, uh, just before we uh, start wrapping up, make a connection between uh, improvising. I think it's easier to think about improvising a lot with the right hand, the right hand's moving all over the keys, Chopin's doing those massive runs. It's all tends to be right hand. But what about the styles that are formed by left-hand patterns? And you kind of did a demo at the start. Uh, that's a form of improvising too, right? Yes. I mean, there's two things here. You can fill with your left hand. You know, uh, let's see. Uh, let's say we're playing Summertime. Which I know is not what you're talking about. But it's, sometimes I try to think that if my left hand were a bassist and my right hand was a trumpet player, I want to make sure they both get to have some fun. Yeah. But that's what you're talking about is stock patterns. And this is a thing I love to teach and I'm, I'm big on because if, if somebody says, I don't know, let's say I play Mary had a little lamb here. Uh, and then someone says, Oh wow. You're so creative. I just, just how, you know, how do you think like that? Well, a hundred percent of what I just played 100% of it was stock pattern stuff. And so knowing patterns uh, makes it possible to accompany your students. It makes it possible to dress up a, a lead sheet or a little song. I'm not sure how you want me to get into this. There's, I can show all kinds of patterns. What's the um, – just play, play the pattern without the melody that you just did then. Yeah, so, okay, that was just – that was a swing pattern. Maybe I'll just go through a few. And so a swing typically has a walking bass. And – B bass players are very inventive in the way they will manipulate the chord in, in their walking. But as a piano player, we can simplify all that and bring it down to a simple pattern. So a, a real go-to pattern among about, oh, five or six, that will get you through 99% of the places you need to walk. A go-to pattern that almost always works is root, second, 
third, fifth. So on a C chord, C, D, E, G. Uh, let's say I'm playing, uh, you know, so Mary Little Lamb is a, a C chord uh, with, without any dressing up the right hand, just. Okay, and what was the right hand doing? Just parallel structures. I'm grabbing a shape here. My shape has the E note on top. And that is the melody note. And then I have C, A, G underneath. So I have this six chord. I put those dig and move that around. Just move it around like my hand's in a cast. I don't have <laughs> to, you know, just move that shape around. And taken taken in a careful listen, there's some wrong kind of notes in there. But in the, in flight, you get away with it. It sounds terrific. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, th there's one. There's There's... Uh, and so that that would, that would be a great go-to jazz walk swing pattern, right? What about uh, you know we, we did a we you did a little tango before, but what about like a rock? What if you wanted to rock out? Mary had a little lamb. What's your okay? What's uh, that's that's that? lovely. So let me. Uh, a lot of times, um, especially teenage boys, figure this out about do what what I call rock octaves, where they're where they're just um, um, C C C C. You know. Oh, alternating yeah. thumb and five. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom with the pinky and the thumb. Uh, and that that is a, that that will get you by sort of a medium uh, happy sound. And I can show you two more. One that's really cool is to put in the, a flat seven. So I'm going to play C to C. But on the way, I'm going to put a B flat in there. Now I'll just play chord notes with my right hand on a C chord. Uh, And do that on an F. That's okay. Cool. I haven't used that yeah. one before. Yeah, I like it. Another one you can do is um, what I call a torch song, where the right hand plays just simple quarter note chords. Think of something like Let It Be. Right? Yep. Okay. And the left hand is going to play long notes with quick little notes connecting to the next root, if that makes sense. So say I'm going to go from a, a C to a G. Here's an F. Yeah. So it's just kind of a moving bass run. there. Yeah. Yeah, and that provides a nice background underneath the, you know, the student playing a, a melody or whatever. So look, it's I mean, we, we could... <laughs> This is a massive kind of uh, area that we could touch on and we don't have time today and that's not really the topic. But I wanted to just mention it because I think this is one of those fundamental ways that teachers can get more creative with their students is to explore these left-hand patterns and the effect that they have on the sound that a student is creating at the keyboard. Uh, right. Now, let me just say, you know, I, I have some... Um like style glossaries and things that I pass out at my workshops and, and list some of these. And sometimes people treat them like they're, they're a silver plate of gold or something here. You, here you need to find stock patterns and you say, what are these stock patterns? Oh, I need to know what they are. You're playing them all the time. If you're playing non-classical music and you, instead of just play it, if one looks at it with a, a thief's mind and says, what is going on in here? What is whoever it is, Dan Coates or some arranger, uh, Philip Kevin and, you know, uh, there's so many good arrangers out there of, of, of movie tunes and pop songs and things. When you get those piano folios, if you just go beyond just playing it and say, what's happening here? What can I borrow on my own? What is this pattern? Why do I like that? That's what I've spent a lifetime doing, both by listening to recordings and looking at music. And think, oh, I like that. I'm going to use that. You don't have to make them all up. I mean – Oh, what's that boogie pattern? Look in any boogie. There it is. Yeah. So I think you have to look like a – almost like look at a piece of music as a, a grocery store where you can bring home some goodies and use them in your other pieces. My plan in the next couple of weeks around this podcast is to create a bit of a, a stock pattern sheet like you've, you've done because I think uh, while you can grab them out of music, uh, it's also good to have a bit of a quick reference. Um, and uh, I like teaching myself uh, – my students – I mean, one of the first patterns that every student should know is an Alberti bass. 
that they can use because that's going to come up and instantly you've got something that sounds classical. Uh, exactly. And then you've got the uh, the pop root five octave, the standard thing that Dan Coates would do with every ballad and film piece. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that there's definitely uh, ways we can approach this with students. And I guess that kind of leads into how you can use lead sheets as well. So where you've got just the melody, chords above it, while you could play a triad in the left hand, it'll sound much more interesting if you give it a style with one of these stock patterns. So I think that's going to have to be the subject of a future discussion though, Bradley. We're running out of time. Now, I'll look forward <laughs> to that. There's always more to chat about with creativity. Uh, it's great. Well, it's so great to chat with you about this. I do enjoy it. Um, so let's uh, have a quick chat about um, 88 Creative Keys because I am Really excited that you guys have invited me to join you as one of your faculty for the workshops in Denver, Colorado. So, um, what first? We only get the best. Tim. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Firstly, um, it's we've got a kind of title for it called "Trending." Is is our title? What? Why is it called that this year? So, my business partner Leela Viss, or teaching partner as well, and good friend, uh, is a co-founder of this workshop, and she. Uh, often has the, the the broad stroke of how things should go. She's great at at sensing what piano teachers are hungry for. And this year we we are doing just piano teachers. In the past we've had adult students as well, who I suppose are welcome, but we're really focusing on pedagogy. And so she noticed that because she goes to so many conferences and blogs and reads magazines uh, for our trade and all, that there really were some trending topics. Um, which boiled down to creativity, the things we talked about today, that group teaching is getting hotter and hotter, which we touched on in the beginning, technology, and business skills, running your studio. And these are things that teachers seem constantly interested in. So since those are the trending topics, we put together the curriculum, and of which you're a huge part of, um, to, to just make sure that those topics are woven through what is essentially a, a workshop about teaching creatively and teaching creativity, which is slightly different. Those are the that's the heart of it, but those these other strands are woven through each hour um, rather than independent topics. Like now, we will now talk about technology. Instead, we're going to show how the technology enhances the topic a, a, of the moment. I liked your your difference in the definition between teaching creatively and teaching creativity. So let me let me tell you my the, my theory on that teaching creatively is about breaking out of the molds of the tradition of piano teaching from the last 200 years and doing different things with your students teaching creativity is about giving your students the skills and experiences they need to create things at the piano would that be your your idea of that as well correct yes and and the teaching creatively is something that Leela Viss is particularly skilled at and as you, as are you, because uh, I see it in your blogs and your and see all the time in, in your in your work, and teaching creativity is is my particular corner. Mm. The the a huge part about teaching creatively that we found over the last five years of running these workshops is that a lot of what goes on is simply giving people permission to let teachers buy into this is your studio, you can do what you want. It's as if they feel there's music police looking around the corner keeping notes and they have to do it just the way they were taught. You can teach it any way you like. And the more you teach the way you like, the more you have a sort of a brand and and uh, students coming to you to get what it is that you do. So um, mm. it's it's there seems to be just some tradition to break through on, on, on getting more creative in our teaching. I agree. Permission to break all the rules uh, is going to it's going to have the most you're, you're going to have the most fun. Your students are going to enjoy it. They're going to be motivated. More practice will happen and uh, life's good in my opinion anyway. Um, so quickly, who, who do you think will, what kind of teacher will get the most benefit out of the workshops, Bradley? Hey, that's, I like that question. We had an inquiry today from a teacher who's been there several years and she's saying, should I come again? Uh, and we always try to have something fresh and new for alumni because we do have re- returning teachers. Uh, but uh as well, we welcome teachers who are not skilled in improvising or teaching creativity or not particularly uh, having a strong jazz background, uh, but are wondering how to get started with that 
or or how to build on that. I'm careful that the curriculum starts simply in all cases, but also moves into a little bit more advanced for those people who want it. So I would say the 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 somewhat experienced teacher who is who is just feeling a little dry, a little um, a little stuck. Uh, and finding a little sense that they don't want to perhaps admit to the parents or even to themselves that that it's sort of a drag to drag yourself down to the seat and go through it again. You know, there's that series, that feeling. At least my teacher had. I had. I could tell that when I got to page seven, she already knew that I was going to play the B flat wrong because she taught out of the same method book her whole life. And if you're kind of feeling stuck, like here we are again, how many more years can I teach for a lease? That's the that's the teacher who we, I think we can uh, just shake it up and and reinvigorate. Have a big impact on, yeah. And it's not all about jazz. I think we should mention that too. We've we've talked a bit about jazz today. Uh, we'll be talking uh, oh, a whole lot on bench, off bench, uh, pop music, um, chord progressions. There will be some jazz, I'm sure. Different styles. I mean, the the program we've been coming up with. I, I like. I'm excited to be sitting in on your sessions and Leela sessions. It's just going to be, it's going to be so good. So um, to find out more teachers, uh, head to 88creativekeys.com and you can click on trending. There's, a, there's an image right on the front page or you can go to the workshop menu. And Bradley, I think we've got an early bird special on uh, for a little bit. Is that right? Yeah, it's just about, uh, you, we're going to have to jump on it. Uh, this this would seem to be marketing blather, but it, um, I can promise you it's true. <laughs> we have the first 10, instead of going by date, we said the first 10 who sign up will receive a discount. And um, we, I believe we had our fifth today. So, okay. and we just opened. It. So we, if you want to, there's five slots left for a discount, but any teacher that is in a professional trade association, such here in the States, Music Teachers National Association, uh, if you can produce a membership card and send us a, a, a picture of that, then you qualify for an additional discount that can be combined with your early birds. So really trying to do everything we can to, to get teachers, to make it possible for teachers to get there. Great deal. And no complaints from anyone who have to uh, travel three hours or four hours or even six hours. It's going to take me... 18 hours I think to get there so <laughs> um, and I will be completely flipped in my time zone so I, I, it's going to be an interesting first day I'll, I'll be on coffee that's for sure uh, well if- the other cool thing is it's in Denver and so what a lot of people do is they're come and go to the, the workshop and then um, head off to the mountains and play for a few days before they go home uh, it's a great idea and I think someone's coming from Australia aren't they other than me a, a teacher is that right it's 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 or a possibly. surprise. It is, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna have we're gonna have at least one surprise guest teacher, uh, and we probably should mention that the last day of the workshop is all business focused, and we have four experts in um, building successful studios and small music schools who are running that entirely. Uh, uh, the whole day is on business, so there's two workshops: three days on teaching creatively and creativity, <laughs> and then one on studio business and and they are um, can be um, attended to, as a package but they can also be attended independently great so of all the information there again at 88 creativekeys.com and if you want to find out more about Bradley you can head to Bradley sowash s o w a s h dot com so I think that's a, a good wrap up there Bradley anything we've missed or that uh, you wanted to add before we sign off Oh, just so much. I have a million ideas, but we'll have to wait and do it again sometime. <laughs> It'll be great. I always enjoy chatting with you. And uh, as I say, I can't wait to be uh, face-to-face having a glass of wine or a coffee through a straw <laughs> when I'm over there in July. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bradley, uh, speak to you again really soon. Thanks again for coming okay. on the show. Bye for now. See you. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.